So in this video, we're going to discuss what's known as central cord syndrome. And this is a type of injury to the spinal cord, uh, specifically the cervical spinal cord. And in order to understand what happens in central cord syndrome, we're going to have to first appreciate the anatomy of the cervical spinal cord. So I'm going to draw out a very rough uh, picture of what the cervical spinal cord um, looks like. And bear with me, my drawing skills are not the best. It's going to look something like this. Okay. And this area here is all of the gray matter uh, of the cervical spinal cord. And then surrounding that area, which I'm going to draw around like this, is the white matter. And this is all outside here. If we draw like this, again, like that, good. So this area here and this area over here that surrounds the gray matter is known as the white matter. Now, this is a picture as if I had sliced your uh, cervical spinal cord like a loaf of bread, and this is towards the front of the neck, which is where the intervertebral discs are located, and this is towards the back of the neck, which is where a ligament known as the ligamentum flavum is located. And what happens is that in central cord syndrome, the neck gets hyperextended, meaning that the head goes backwards relative to the cervical cord. And uh, what's thought to believe um, is the mechanism is that this uh, disc and uh, pushes up against the ligamentum flavum, damaging this area here in the middle of the cervical cervical cord. Hence the name central cord syndrome. And at this point, uh, we need to discuss uh, some very important tracts that run up and down the cervical cord, as well as some important areas in the gray matter, so that we can better appreciate um, the uh, symptoms uh, that people have when they come in with a central cord syndrome. Now, in the gray matter, uh, there's an area here in the anterior portion, or the portion towards the front of the neck, uh, which is known as the anterior horn. And this contains motor neurons that are responsible for motor movements. And they kind of dot this area of the cervical cord here. And then out in the white matter are two very important tracts, or actually three very important tracts. Uh, the first one uh, is here, and it's lateral or towards the side of the cord. And that's known as the corticospinal, corticospinal tract. And then down here is another tract known as the spinothalamic, spinothalamic. Uh, it's also known as the anterior lateral system. Um, and the corticospinal tract is another motor movement tract uh, that sends uh, motor information down towards various areas of the body uh, to control motor movements. And it's organized um, in a very important way in that uh, towards the middle of the, of the cervical cord um, are motor fibers that go to the upper extremities. And as you work out towards the outside or the lateral portion of the cord, you get into the lower extremities. And that's the same organization of the spinothalamic tract which controls pain and temperature information. Um, like I said, the coracospinal tract is motor movement. Um, and in the spinal thalamic tract, it's very similar in that we have the upper extremities located more towards the middle of the cord and the lower extremities located more towards the outside of the, of the cord or, or towards the periphery of the cord. Now back here uh, is another white matter tract uh, known as the dorsal columns. And they control uh, light touch light touch, and vibration sensation. And they're typically not involved in a central cord syndrome. So now that we have this understanding of the anatomy of the cervical spinal cord, we can uh, better understand uh, what happens when people come in and what their symptoms will be. So you can imagine that this disc and this ligamentum flavin kind of pinch the middle of the cord here together and you get damage uh, mostly in this area, but then edema, um, and secondary injury uh, actually expands the initial uh, zone of injury to include all of this here. And so what you find is that you get damage to the anterior horn cells here in the gray matter, and that leads to a flaccid weakness at the level of the injury. 
And since we're talking about the cervical cord, we're typically talking about um, motor neurons that go to the hands and upper extremities. And then we also get damage to the white matter tracts and the coracospinal tract. And preferentially, we get damage to the upper extremity uh, motor um, tracts. So that further leads to lower extremity, or I'm sorry, upper extremity weakness. And that weakness over time is a spastic weakness, which is similar to what happens in a stroke patient. But the lower extremities are out here laterally or in the periphery of the cord, and they're typically spared. So that's why um, the motor exam in somebody suffering from a central cord syndrome is that they have upper extremity weakness that's greater than lower extremity weakness. Now, same thing with the spinothalamic tracts. Now, when we talk about pain and temperature sensation, the upper extremities are preferentially damaged more than the lower extremities. Uh, and that's why you get a pain and temperature differential that typically affects the upper extremities relative to the lower extremities. And then light touch and vibration are, are actually relatively spared. So they typically are unaffected in somebody with a central cord syndrome. Now, depending, of course, on the severity of the injury, there can be all kinds of gradations uh, in terms of how much weakness there is, um, uh, how much lower extremity weakness versus upper extremity weakness, and vice versa. But typically, in a central cord syndrome, uh, patients present with upper extremity weakness that is greater, so upper extremity weakness that is greater than lower extremity weakness. And same thing with sensation, uh, specifically pain and temperature sensation is more affected in the upper extremities relative to the lower extremities. Uh, so that's a brief overview of central cord syndrome. Um,